the past few weeks, Pastor Greg has been doing a series on being a Christ follower. On being a Christ follower. The reason is this. The word Christian has lost its meaning in our current culture and context. Like even Lady Gaga seems to, be, uh, seems to claim that she's a Christian. There are so many people out there who say that they are Christians. So it's like using the word love. We say we love somebody, we love a particular person, and at the same time, in the same breath, we say we love donuts. We love doing this, we love doing that. But does it mean the same? So he presented to us, based on a particular book that he's been reading, DNA of a Christ follower, the eight essential traits of a Christ follower, written by Darren Ride. The DNA of a Christ follower. So in our current context, what we need to do is, we have to slowly move away from the word Christian and be very, very um, careful in saying that we are Christ followers. Because there was a time, I mean years ago, when people were identified that they were Christians just by the fact, by what they did, meaning when they carried the Bible and they went to church, they were really Christians, the majority of them. They were called Bible people. And even in Acts, in the book of Acts, the first time the word Christian was named or when somebody was called Christian where, when the people around there saw the actions or the life of the disciples. They saw how they lived. They lived in a particular way and they said, okay, if you live like this, then that means you're a Christian. You are a follower of Christ. So that is how it all started. But now because of this um, moving away from that, now we got to be very, very uh, particular and careful to say, even if somebody asks you, who are you, you should be able to say, I am a follower of Christ. Because people follow many things. There are so many things out there that people follow. There are so many celebrities that are out there people are following. So who are you following? And today we had this nice song that was being sung. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Everybody has got, has the right to know who Jesus is. Everybody ought to tell who Jesus is. The first picture right there on the screen is the double hexical strand or helical strand, they call it. It's the DNA. This is a self-replicating material that is found in every living organism. And it is the main constituent of a chromosome. And you know, we are all composed of like, uh, I forget, this 22, 26 chromosomes? 26, okay. And then you have the XX and the XY. Remember? If you're an XY, you're a man. You're an XX, you're a woman. You're a female and a man. So, deoxyribonucleic acid is the expansion of DNA. And there's another form called RNA, which is ribo or ribonucleic acid. There are two forms there. But we are talking about DNA because this contains the genes that is being transmitted from... Um, from the beginning, from wherever it comes from. Now, you know recently there's been a trend, or not a trend, there's been a way that you can do a DNA test or ancestral DNA test to find out where you're going to come, what's your heritage, whether you're 90% Irish, 50% European, or 5% Jewish, what American, where do you come from, etc. So, I mean, many people go, they pay money, they try to find out, you know, what's their ancestral genes that has been passed down to them, who are the people, like, uh, way back in their ancestry. But, you know, if you do a DNA test on me, in and out, I'll come out as an Indian. <laughs> There's no other way out. But then, if you really go back and start testing further and further, there will be a DNA test that will prove that I am related to a person called Mr. Adam. And he's in the Bible. 
and he has transmitted something to me which is called the sin syndrome which I still use every day in my life, which I'm capable of using every day. Not that I use it every day, I should correct myself. I'm not a sinner. I was a sinner but I'm saved by grace. All right. So, we all have this sin syndrome that has been transmitted into our DNA. But here the writer is talking about what are the DNA characteristics of a Christ follower. But there's one more point that you need to understand about the DNA. And that is, in every uh, genome or the genetic material in a DNA, 99.9% we all have the same genes. And that is why you are, we are all human beings. 99.9% we are all the same. There is only 0.1% that is different and that makes us unique. That 0.1% makes us very, very unique. And what is that 0.1% that has made you or how God has created you to be unique? That, that's amazing how he does that. It's like, for example, it says that... A genome is kind of a book. And all the chapters, all the paragraphs are the same. But if you print it in India, what they will use as the spelling for the word color would be C-O-L-O-U-R, because that is a British spelling. But if you print it here in America and they use the word here, they will not spell it as C-O-L-O-U-R, they will spell it as C-O-L-O-R. You know, that, that's, a, that's the point one difference. Okay. If I am 99.9% .9 the same as Sister Karen Scott, what is that 0.1% that makes us different? As I'm thinking about it, do you all want me to do announcements anytime? <laughs> She's so unique. The way she comes out uh, by making an announcement brings it to life. You all want to listen, right? You want to listen to the announcements and Karen Scott makes it. You don't want me to make announcements. <laughs> I'll be boring out here. I say, okay, this is what you do, that's what you do. But she go, amen, 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 amen. And I mean, unlike me, I can't do it. I cannot be Karen Scott. She's got that point one percent inside of her that makes her absolutely unique. She's a unique creation of God. And I have my own. And each and every one of us have our uniqueness in that point one percent. And that is the gifting and the talents that God gives us when he creates us and also when he has regenerated us. But we'll come to that. But in just a quick review of what has already been taught here or preached here, I said eight characteristics and we have already done four and we are going to do the fifth one today. What are the four things that already has been done? If you are a true Christ follower, you will be number one, a lover of God. Primarily, you will be a lover of God. Everything else will be secondary. He will be your topmost priority. Number two, you will be a lover of people. Number one, you will be a lover of God. Number two, you will be a lover of people. Number three, you will, not, you will love truth. Because there's so much lies out there. People distort the truth. But you will love the truth, no matter what, whether you accept it or not. Whatever the Bible says, you will, accept, you will believe it and you will say that is true. So you'll be a lover of God, you'll be a lover of people, you'll be a lover of truth. And number four, you will live a holy life. A holy life. You will love, you will want to live pure in the eyes of God. And all this happens, not just like that, that's why... That it happens only when you become a Christ follower. Only when you want to follow Christ, when, that's when you will start loving God more. Amen. You will want to love people. You will want to love the truth no matter what it says. Whether you like it or not, whether the culture approves it or not, you will say, I love this truth. And then that will also lead you to live the most holy life that you can ever live. Why? Because you're a follower of Christ. Yes. And how does that start? Regeneration. Amen. You are born again in the spirit. Amen. 
that's where it starts now this leads me on to today's um, trait of a Christ follower and that is evangelism you know this is another word that's been like used in a Christian I mean in churches where we say oh evangelism evangelism we got to be about evangelism yes one of the cardinal truths that you and I will have to understand is that if you are a true follower of Christ you will be evangelistic mm -hmm. you will be evangelistic that's what the writer says and we agree and that's what the scripture says why because Jesus himself if I say where is a great commission tell me the great commission Matthew 28 19 to 20 then Mark 16 15 you will say that but I want to capture for you what Luke says Luke the doctor he captures it in two verses and he tells you what will evangelism look like what is evangelism evangelism is from the root word in Greek euangelion meaning good news that is all good news and uh, we all have good news to share right I mean after coming here or even growing up I've heard this whenever we are in a conversation with people we ask two things we ask them do you want to hear the good news first or the bad news first right good news or bad news and then we have both kinds of news and then we want to tell them first whichever news you want okay they'll say okay first give me the bad news and then give me the good news because you want the good news to be in your heart right similarly as much as the scripture says you only have good news I would want to actually add to it our good news or euangelion as much as it is called that it comprises of both bad news and good news because the bad news will have to come first without the bad news there is no good news without the bad news so what is the bad news I am a sinner the first thing that you tell people what is the bad news you and I are sinners by birth that is what I said ancestral DNA it's been passed down to me I am sinful at birth David says I was I was born in sin there's a sinful nature within me and that is why you need a savior and you are regenerated so the good news is you don't have to remain a sinner and that is what people need to hear what is the good news okay you're a sinner is that does it stop there no you become a better person not a better person you become a regenerated person you become a Christ follower and this is the good news that Christ died for you and let's see what Luke says in cha chapter 24 after the resurrection and all that he's going on to say this verse 45 then he opened their minds that is Jesus so that they could understand the scriptures he told them this is what is written so this is kind of the bad news or the good news you can put it together actually the good news this is the good news first that Christ will suffer imagine is that the good news yes the suffering of Christ is the good news because he became the propitiation for our sins he was the sacrifice of our for our sins on the cross and that is the good news otherwise you and I will have to be on the cross you and I should be crucified on the cross for our sins for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord why it is eternal life because Jesus went to the cross for you and me instead of you being put on the cross for your sins the good news is that Jesus took your place and here he says that Christ will suffer he doesn't stop there he will rise again on the third day from the dead so the crucifixion of Christ the resurrection of Christ that is the good news and now what is the bad news because you're a sinner then he goes on to say Luke says repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations repentance and forgiveness of sins not prosperity please hear me what should be preached in Jesus name to all nations Luke clearly tells us here these are the two things you preach repentance and forgiveness Luke tells that Jesus said this Luke is not writing he is writing but he is reporting to us what Jesus told him 
He, because Jesus told them, he's saying, re, Jesus is saying, repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And then he says, you are witnesses of these things. So Jesus is talking to his disciples and saying, you are witnesses of these things. And he's speaking after the resurrection. And the word witness, the word witness, you know what does it mean? In the Greek, it's martyria, meaning you're a martyr. You will be willing to die for this reason, as a witness. Because you know what? I died, but I rose again on the third day, and here I am seated in your midst. I am communing with you. I broke bread, and repentance and forgiveness will be preached in my name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Okay, why did I choose this particular text? to nail this great commission or this good news is because he combines two things. Matthew doesn't talk about it, but Luke combines both of these things in this one text. You cannot do this without this. And this is what Jesus is saying in verse, four, in verse 49. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So how can you preach repentance and forgiveness of sins in his name to all nations? Acts 1.8 But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And you will be my witnesses, again in the same word is used, in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria and, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. You will receive power. It's the Holy Spirit that will give you the power to go and tell another person, you are a sinner. And it is he who will convict him. You and I cannot convict anybody. You and I cannot bring anyone to Christ. I cannot do anything if the Holy Spirit does not convict you in your heart and make you to feel the need of a Savior in your life. To become a true Christian Christ follower. So Luke chapter 24 verses 45 to 49 captures for us what is the good news and the bad news. And what should be preached? What should be preached? The repentance and forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus Christ. And do we have a proof that Jesus did it? Yes, right there, right up front, when he started his ministry, after the wilderness experience where he was uh, tempted by the devil, he, the first preaching words from out of Jesus' mouth in Matthew 4, 19 was, Repent! And believe, repent, turn around, metanoia, a turning around in your mind. Completely turn around from the way you've been living. And go in a new direction. Repent, 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 repent. And that is the message of Christ. Because he came to reconcile us to God himself. So, as I said today, evangelism. What is it that you have to preach? And what is it that you should have already experienced that you can go and tell other people? That yes, I was a sinner, but now I'm a saint because I have been purified, cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. I'm a regenerated person. I'm a new person. I'm a new creation in Christ. I have a new way of life new way of living. My thoughts are different. My desires are different. It's not in line with the world or the culture. It's completely different. And now I have the good news inside of me. And when I come and share the good news, I will also share the bad news with you first. Because you need to hear it. And then you need to hear, like when the doctors come, they have to first tell you, okay, I'm sorry, I have to give you this bad news. You have something going on in your body. But you know what? The good news is I have a cure. We have a cure. We can do certain things in order to rectify that situation. And that is what happens here. Now, this writer of this book, he gives us four evangelistic attributes. Four evangelistic attributes. And we are going to go through that. So if you are a truly a Christ follower, and evangelism is in your blood, in your DNA, it has to be that you want to share. These are the four attributes, character attributes that will 
identify that you have this evangelistic DNA in your system, in your spirit. Number one, you will value people and individuals. Value people. You will value them. Why would you value them? You will value them because they are created in the image of God. You will value people more than anything else. Why do you have to value them? In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, if you look at that text, why? Because God values them first. Because he say, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, this is good and pleases God, that meaning we have to live peaceful and quiet lives. And why? Because God our Savior, He wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Now do you connect it? The truth, knowledge of the truth, that's another attribute that we already spoke about, Pastor Greg spoke about two weeks ago. Truth. What does Jesus want? He wants all men. Not one person. Not a particular people group. Not a particular nationality. No. He, want, he wants all men to be saved. He values every individual. Each and every person. Because he created you and me in the image of God. And he wants all of us to be saved. And that is why... Similarly, because if we become his followers, you and I will also value people. We will not look down on people because of their color, because of their ethnicity, because of their educational qualifications, because of the money that they make. We will not look at them, we will not um, degrade them, or we will say this is who they are, we will not give names to them. We will just love them. We will love people. Amen. Now remember the other characteristic, you love people. No matter what. I know people are difficult. People are difficult. It's easy. It's like I think I remember seeing it in one office. There is so much of joy when some people come into the office. There is greater joy when some people leave the office. <laughs> so, people are different. They are unique. But you know what? Jesus values every person. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, you know why Jesus is still waiting to come back? If you start thinking about it, you know during that time, even in the first century, people were waiting for Christ to come back. And they were thinking, you know what, we've been waiting for Jesus to come back and he's not coming back. And then for that Peter writes, you know what, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. And then he goes on to say that the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, he is patient with you. Why? Not wanting anyone to perish. See, he wants all men to be saved. He does not want anyone to perish. It's both sides. He wants everybody to, to be saved. And he does not want anyone to perish. But you know why people will perish? It's not because God does not want them. It's going to be because of their own decision. It's going to be because of their own decision. It's going to be your decision and my decision. Because he has created us, created us as free human beings. He has given us the free will. Sometimes we wish that God does not, has not given us the free will. He will make us do certain things. But you know what? That doesn't constitute love. He's not a loving person. Can I force somebody to love me and say, you have to love me, you have to give me this card, you have to give it to me. And then they come and say, okay, I love you. Listen, what, what joy is it going to give me? But when they think about you, when they themselves come and say those words, voluntarily, you truly understand that, hey, this person really loves me. They thought about me. It's not a demand on them. And that is why free will plays, comes into play. Jesus, God wants us to love him out of our own free will. And that is why the decision is in your hands and my hands. Value people and individuals. All of us have a decision to make. He wants all men to be saved. He does not want anyone to perish. Number two, the second evangelistic attribute is, there will be a distinct and redemptive lifestyle. You will identify them by their lifestyle, by how they live, by their actions. In Antioch, as I already mentioned earlier, 
You know why they were called Christians? Because they looked at them and said, these people are living in a particular way. We can see that they are following a particular person. And who is it that they are following? Jesus Christ. So we have to call them as Christians. Christians. Would people call you and me as Christians because we are followers of Christ or because we go to church or we do certain things? So that's something that we need to consider. Distinctive, a redemptive lifestyle. A lifestyle that is different from the world, from the norm that is expected of us. And in Matthew 5, 13 to 16, two metaphors that Jesus gives us. And what are those two metaphors? Salt and light. Salt gives flavor. Something that is not with salt, I mean it's so bland, we want to throw it away into the garbage. And what does light do? Light gives, uh, it gives you room to move around. It gives you guidance. So you are the light of the world. And not only that, Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. So unless the light of the world is inside of you, you can be the light of the world. You can be a guide to other people. And above all, the scripture says, his word is a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. His word guides us. He gives us light. You don't have to go anywhere. If you're in the word and you read it, it guides you every day in your life what to do and what not to do. It gives you very, very clear instructions. You know, the reason why we do not, uh, we, are, we are in a mess sometimes is because we do not know because we do not read. And sometimes we know, but we overlook. We don't want to do it. We want to have our own way. We want to have our freedom. Though parents tell us, or elders tell us, or the church, everywhere they preach to us, it, it, it doesn't get into us because we are not, basically it's because we, are not, we have not made the decision to be Christ followers. You know how Jesus said when I have to preach? You know how he said you have to preach? Go and preach. And if the people receive it, they are mine. They will receive it. And if some people do not receive it, just let it go. They are not mine. He said it. And he said even in missionary work, when you go to certain villages, if they receive you, stay there and continue the work. Otherwise, just shake the dust off your feet and keep moving on. People who are mine will receive my word. They will rejoice in my word. They will delight in my word. They'll want to do what the scripture tells. A distinctive, redemptive lifestyle. 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 11 through 12. 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 11 through 12. What does Peter write? Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world. Look at the words that he picked. Aliens. Who's an alien? An alien is from outer space, right? Completely different. An alien comes, drops in today. You look at him. Oh, he's so different. An alien has come. Completely different. So how are you supposed to be? Like an alien and a stranger in the world. And what, what he goes on to say? To abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans, meaning among the unbelievers, people who do not follow Christ, you must live such good life that though they accuse you of doing wrong, though they may accuse you of not towing their own line, though they accuse you of not tolerating them, though they accuse you of that, you know what? They may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. That should be your redemptive lifestyle. They can accuse you of being wrong. Yes, they will. They did not accept Jesus' pronouncements. They hated him without reason, the scripture says. And they will hate us without reason. They will not want us to, they will accuse us of not tolerating them or not accepting them or not agreeing with them. But do you fall in line with them? Or are you going to say, no, this is what the scripture tells, but you live such good lives, you don't hate them. 
You don't look down upon them. You do not de denigrate them or degrade them. You look at them and love them as God's people created in his own image. On the same level as you. But still you live such good lives on this word of God, based on this word of God, such that they will go, they may see your good deeds. Who? The unbelievers, the pagans, people who are not like you. They will see your good deeds and say, wow, these people, they are different. They live such good lives. I can't accuse them of doing any wrong. On the day when God visits us, meaning there is an eternal time frame where God is going to come down. That's number two. Number three, works to be ready. Works to be ready. First Peter 3, 15 to 16. First Peter 3, 15, 15 through 16. Works to be ready. Meaning, okay, how can you be ready to share this good news? Sometimes preparation is required. What does First Peter 3, 15 through 16 says? This is what it says. But in your heart, in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Meaning, Christ is the Lord of your life. And then it says, always be prepared to give an answer or give the reason for the hope that is in you. So if somebody asks you, why are you a Christ follower? Are you prepared with a reason? Can you tell them why you are a Christ follower? Or you say, no, I don't know. I mean, I'm just following Christ. Do you have a reason why you are a Christ follower? Because anyone who asks you, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And how do you do it? Do this with gentleness and respect. you got to do this with gentleness and respect. Be gentle with the people around you. And respectful of them. And answer them in that way. So you live a distinct, redemptive lifestyle. And also you work to be ready. You prepare yourself. In whatever gifts or talents God has given you, you need to be prepared. You need to know the scriptures. Okay, if you have to share the gospel with somebody, do you know what are the scriptures that you would use? Do you have it at the top of your head? Would you be able to say, in Romans 6.23 it says this. Romans 3.23 it says this. And then you go to John 3.16, the promise. And then you go to Colossians chapter... Uh, 3.17, tell them what Jesus has done on the cross for us. For he rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his son whom he loves, in whom there is forgiveness and redemption of sins. Would you be able to tell them those scriptures? Are you prepared? Do you know where will you go in the scriptures to say, these are the words that has brought me to Christ? Do you know your scriptures well enough? That is preparation. You know why sometimes we are all uh, like sitting ducks? Because we do not know where our values come from. We need to be prepared. We need to know the scriptures, how to answer the people. So, and in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15 it says, Study to show yourself or do your best to show yourself approved by God. Approved by God. Rightly dividing the truth of God's word. Meaning, you should do your study, you must prepare yourself, do your best. Why? Not to impress other people. See, that's what we think, oh, if we study, if I get an education, I go and speak, people will be impressed. No, do your best to show yourself approved by whom? By God. I am doing all of this in order to gain his approval, not, my, not your approval. If I live for, um, to be pleased by, to please people, God says, Jesus says, I do not belong to him. I need to please him. I need to live for the approval of God himself. So, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, do your best to show yourself approved by God, to be approved by him. Rightly dividing the word of truth, meaning you are able to understand the word in its context. Very, very important. And number four, make sacrifices and takes risk. Make sacrifices and takes risk. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22. 
1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 22. This is what Paul writes. To the weak I became weak. To win the weak. I have become all things to all men. So that by all possible means I might save some. Be ready to make sacrifices. Be ready to make sacrifices. To make changes in your life. Do not just keep holding on to the past. I have become all things to all people. Meaning, in order to identify myself with a particular group of people, I try to do what they also do. So that somehow making them understand so that they will come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Chapter 9 verse 22, it says, By all possible means, it might save some. All possible means. Use whatever is given to you in order to try to reach out to other people. So this number, number one is valuing people and individuals. Number two is living a distinct redemptive lifestyle. Number three is working to be ready, preparing yourself, studying, studying the word, being in the word, knowing what to share. And number four, make sacrifices and take risks. Let's start, let's start with Philippians chapter 2 verse 25 to 30. I want to see, an, I want to give you an example of uh, how Paul describes one particular person. He is not a very popular person in the scriptures, in the sense that we all know, we do not use his name so easily. But his name is Epaphroditus. And this is what he is saying about Epaphroditus. In uh, 25 to 30, he talks about him. He says, you know, I am going to send this man, Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier. He is also your messenger whom you sent to take care of my needs. And he's a perfect example of being an evangelist. Listen to it. Of making sacrifices and taking risks. And this is what he says about Epaphroditus. He says, He longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him. And not on him only, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad that I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him. You know, we don't hear about this man, Epaphroditus. Some of us have heard Epaphroditus in the Bible. And you know what Paul is writing about him? He's writing about him, honor men like him, because why? Why should you honor men like him? Because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. You could not give me some help, but this guy, Epaphroditus, he almost died and he risked his life. Making sacrifices and risking your life. That is an evangelistic attribute. So number, all the four, very quickly, values people and individuals. Number two, a distinctive, redemptive lifestyle that is completely different. Like you are an alien or a stranger in the world. Number three, you work to be ready. You study, you prepare yourself. And number four, make sacrifices and take risks. These are the four evangelistic attributes. Now, we have these words going on uh, in our uh, Christendom, meaning in our church culture. We talk about, oh, missionaries, evangelists, etc., so I'm going to give you just four roles of uh, this evangelism. You know why? Because this has been distorted. I know many people come here and say, oh, everybody is a missionary. Is everyone a missionary? No. Everybody is not a missionary. People come and say, oh, if a, who is a missionary? Oh, everybody is a missionary. We all have to be missionaries. No, that's not what the scripture says. Let's look at what a missionary means. The word apostolo, the sent one. Number one, missionary. You know the best example? Jesus Christ. He left his glorious throne above. He emptied himself completely and became like a human. Became a servant. Like a human being. He degraded himself. He left something that was his own, his glory, and became something completely different to become like a human being in order to save you and me. He is a sent one, a missionary. Who is a missionary? A missionary is one who relocates and immerses himself into another culture. He leaves his home. He leaves his comfort. 
And that is why, you know, we are so grateful to God for all the missionaries who came to the East from the West. They all left everything. They went there. They stayed. They lived. They immersed themselves in the culture. And you know what? One of the person, Amy Carmichael, she came to South India. She's from Ireland, Belfast, Ireland. And when she came to South India, she set up an orphanage there. And you know what's, what's important about her? It seems for 55 years, she did not return back to Ireland, to her home place. Completely sacrificed everything and became one among the Indian people there. And there is an orphanage that she set up. Even now there are people who are growing up there. Children. And they will call her Amma, godly woman, who sacrificed everything and lived among them and became one among them. So a missionary is one who relocates himself, leaving what is comfortable, his comfort zone, and lives in a completely another culture and for the sake of Christ. And what's number two? Quickly, evangelist. This is another word, evangelist. This is another role. What is evangelist? Who is an evangelist? This person, it's a gift. Because in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, uh, chapter chapter 4, verses 11 through 12, Paul talks about it. He said, God, it, it is he who gave some to be apostles, to be prophets, to be teachers, to be evangelists. So it's a gift that God gives. Who's an evangelist? An evangelist one who's gifted relationally. You know, there are some of you here who can easily strike up a conversation with anybody on the road. I'm not talking about people just walking up and saying, hey, how are you doing? Nobody responds to you. Not that kind of a relationship. But you know, you really strike up a serious conversation. I want to remember my dear brother, Bill Papao. He passed away a few weeks ago. And uh, it was in the early years of my, me trying to, be, uh, having, uh, trying to build a relationship with him. was in the process of building a relationship with him. One day I go, we are meeting here in the church foyer. And then he comes to me and says, hey, how are you doing, brother Bill? I asked him, ready to get to my next business. And you know what he says? Do you have 15 minutes, Pastor? I want to talk to you. Can I give you, do you have 15 minutes for me? So that I can tell you how I'm doing? I was ready to go. He caught me in my tracks. I said, how are you doing, brother? Okay, right, good, okay, right. I'm ready to go to the next business. But no, he said, do you have 15 minutes? I said, oh, okay, okay, okay. Let, let me stand here. Okay, you can talk. You know, we don't have time for people. But there are, this is the gift of an evangelist. They are gifted relationally. They are conversationalists. They can put, have a nice conversation with people, any stranger, on the plane or in a coffee shop, a Starbucks, anywhere. And then they share the story of the gospel. That's one. And number three, the evangelistic role is marketplace. This is where most of us are. As I told you, missionaries and uh, evangelists are gifts. And God only gives it to certain people. Let's not just, oh, I'm a missionary, I'm an evangelist. No. You are given a gift, you are given an ability, you are given that ability to do that particular role or the task. Number three, this is where we are all, uh, I mean, we all will find our place. Marketplace. Most of us are in this category, meaning wherever you are. You are in your house, you are in a job, you are in your school, wherever, wherever you are, through your words, through your actions, you are sharing the, your gospel, sharing the, your, the story, the true story. So most of us who are lifestyle, we are living. We are showing them whether we can, we can tell with our words whether we are Christians or not. I mean, we can say what we are, but then they will know us by our actions. More than the words that we speak. They look at you and me, what we are doing. And number four, relationship and friendship. You know, friendship evangelism, relationship evangelism. And why did I put it as a separate category? Is because it takes time to build a relationship. I'm reminded of... Uh, an apologist who passed away recently at a very young age, Dr. Nabil Qureshi, who came from the Muslim faith into the Christian faith, and a person called Dr. David Wood. They met in a medical college, and that's where they struck up a relationship, and it took two years before Nabil understood and gave in to the claims of Christ. It didn't happen just like that. You know what? We all want things to happen. We all want to go out and say, oh, I prayed with this person, this person accepted Christ. No, 
it takes time, two years, for him to expound and explain the gospel, answer questions. And after two years, he gave his life to Christ. He came into faith. And he lived such a powerful life for even the short time that he lived that is still making an impact now, even after he's gone. You know, that is the power of regeneration. That is the power of regeneration. Marketplace, relationship, friendship evangelism. So as I say this in application, I want you all to think, who are a couple of people that you can pray for? Because that's my first point in application. So what are the action steps that you need to take? Number one, prayer. Without prayer, it is not going to move anybody. Without prayer, it's not going to move anybody. Now today I'm going to challenge you. Think of a couple of people who do not know the Lord in your workplace, in your surroundings, in your relationships, even within your family. Pray for them. Don't lose heart. I know some of you are praying for your loved ones, for your children or your grandchildren. You do not know when they will come to Christ. But believe me, keep praying. Do not give up. The Spirit of God is at work. He will continue to work. Prayer, intercession, bathe them in prayer. And you will see what's happening. You know, there are times when I have prayed, Lord, can you bring somebody into my office? Or can I get somebody with whom I can share? Because it, I want to share the story. And suddenly something happens. I wish I can pray this every day, but I'm not intent. Let me, let me be honest. I should be more consistent in doing that. Because God will bring those people into our life with whom we can share the good news. So prayer and intercession, very, very critical, number one. Second, the personal story. Do you have a personal story? You know, currently uh, on Facebook, what they do is, you know, add to you. This person added to their story. You know, their profile has become a story. This person added to their story. And for me, as I was thinking, you know, in my, imagina in, in my imagination, the most powerful evangelistic tool or the fact that you and I can do it, that you, you and I can be uh, evangelistic, meaning sharing good news, you know what is the proof? And the tool that we all use, whether you like it or not, I'll tell you, you are all evangelists in that regard. Can I tell you which tool that you use? WhatsApp. <laughs> Anything good comes to you, what's the next thing you do? Forward. To 100 people. Everybody gets, oh, why, why do you do that? Oh, I like it. I want everybody to know about it, right? If Macy's got a sale or if they're giving like $10, you want to go tell your co-worker. You know, today Macy, they're giving $10 free. You can go and get your stuff. You have a good news you want to share. You want to share the blessings. Why is it then that we do not want to share the good news of you and I being saved from wretchedness, from sinfulness, into eternal life? Something has to change inside of us. A personal story. Do you have a personal story? Do you know when and how it transpired? For some people it happens instantaneously. For some of us it's through a series of steps. But it happens inside your heart and you know it. And you can tell your friends or your co-workers, yes, one day I can tell my story. When I was almost going to be 17, though I was a church baby, born in the church, bathed in the church, baptized in the church, singing in the choir, doing everything, before the age of 17, I knew that I was a sinner and I gave my life to Christ. And that day my life changed. I have a personal story. Another thought on this is because, you know, sometimes we look at the personal stories and we think that, oh, we want to really listen to those stories that are like rags to riches, from the worst to the best, saying, oh, we want to do this. So in my seminary, in my college one day, uh, during one of the classes, they gave us an assignment saying that you've got to share your testimony in like five minutes. And, you know, thinking, I mean, being who I am, I wanted to think, wanted to make it very interesting. And then I go, and then my professor, he already knows my background. So I go stand up there, and then I'm starting my uh, testimony and saying, you know, I was an alcoholic at the age of 12. You know, I was into drugs. I was womanizing. I was doing this. You know what? I did this. I did that and did that. I just listed all the worst sins of the world that I could ever do. I listed all of them, and I said, you all think I did it? 
no, that's a lie. I did not do it. And then I told them I was in the church, I was a good guy, very, very goody, considered to be the most holiest of persons. And then I told them I had a change in my heart. And then uh, the Lord touched me and then I gave my life to Christ. You know what the professor told me and that really stood with me? He said, Solomon, I see that there's something that you need to, you need to learn. You know, the way that you were going along saying all of those things, I said, this is not this guy. I know this guy. He is not that. Why is he lying? Why is he telling a lie right there? And why does he want to then at the end of it say that, no, that is not who I was. I was this and then tell that. He said, you need to own your background. He said, it's a good story. You do not have to be bad in order to be good. In effect, you are bad. Whether you have done it or not, you are bad. You're bad. The scripture says you're bad. You're dead in your transgressions and in your sins. Own that. You don't have to do those bad things to become bad. You're already bad. And you need a savior. Your personal story. Do you have a personal story? Can you make it concise to share with the people? And number three, your personal story and the way you do it will combine with your passions and your interests. That is the gifting that the Lord has given you. What are the abilities that God has given you? Probably, this is the best example I can give you. Some of you could be extremely talented in sports. So it's at the gym. It's when you're playing, that's where you'll meet people right. and you can strike up a conversation and that you'll be able to share a story. Think about me. Can I be a sportsman? Can I be an athlete? I wish I am. I wish I'm a top, uh, top-notch cricketer, but I'm not. But you know, keep, God gives gifts to certain people. He places you in certain contexts. And that's a marketplace. So with your passions and your interests, you can share your story. So number one, prayer. Number two, you need to know your personal story. And number three, with your passions and your interests, you can share what God has given in your life. So these are the attributes. This will define you to be a Christ follower. Would you take this to heart this morning? Or this afternoon, even as we close this. I want you to think about, do you really have a personal story? If you don't have one, it is time and ask the Lord today. Lord, tell me where I am in my walk with you. I want to be a true Christ follower. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say the prayer of blessing right now. But I want you to be in silence. I mean, be, maintain this atmosphere. Because this is very critical very significant as much as the previous four attributes are because if you do not have a story if you do not have this experience of being regenerated there is no way you are going to be evangelistic i'm going to say the prayer of blessing and then when the song is going to be sung i want you to remain where you are if you want to stand where you are, you want to kneel, or you want to even come to the altar, I want you to spend time in prayer and asking for the Lord, asking the Lord, Lord, show me where I am in my walk with you. And if you're sure of your walk with the Lord, that you are regenerated, ask Him for a fresh infusion of the Holy Spirit that He will empower you today to be His witness. Because everyone needs compassion. Everyone needs forgiveness. So two things. One, if you do not have a personal experience with the Lord, really knowing that you are regenerated by the Spirit of God, I want you to remain. And number two, if you do not have this fervor in you or this desire in you to share Christ with people, to share your story of what he has done in your life with other people. I want you to remain and say, Lord, 
infuse me with the power of the Holy Spirit. Like what Jesus said, wait in the city, still you are clothed from, with power from on high. You need that power, the Holy Spirit's power and that ability to share his love with other people. So the blessing of the Lord Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit abide with us all now and forevermore.